please join me in welcoming Dr. Don Huber. Well, Gabe, I appreciate the invitation, the opportunity the grass-fed exchange has offered me here. Hope I'm worthy of it. Share a little bit of my research and the research of many others. There are over 1,700 peer-reviewed papers on the danger and hazards and risks from genetically engineered organisms and the glyphosate that's so common a uh, contaminant of them. So I'll share that research, share that material with you. This is a mural that's on the cafe of a, a restaurant in uh, Los Angeles, California, expressing their feelings on the GMO food. This restaurant only serves non-GMO organic food there, have a grandson that's a uh, uh, surgeon, as we were visiting him and drove by, I just couldn't afford not to take a picture of that. Fairly well uh, describes the situation. Now Gabe will appreciate this, uh, I had a couple that farmed both in Canada and also in, on the U.S. side of the border had for about four generations and they finally got around to building him a new home, settled in and just as they'd settled in there was a knock on the door and U.S. Customs and Immigration asked if they'd come in and visit with them and they said well sure, no problem at all. And one of the customs agents said uh, well we just want to let you know that you built your house on the uh, U.S. side of the border, and we noticed that you're Canadian citizens. And the woman said, thank goodness, I don't think I could have stood another one of those terrible Canadian winters. <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes it's in perspective here. We need to remember that in agriculture and farming is really the managing of an ecology. That ecology consists of the plant, the physical environment, a very dynamic biological environment, and then your pests and stresses and those things that, that are involved. So that as we manage this ecology, as we are farming, we're making all of the conditions that are favorable for the plant and make them less favorable for those pests and stresses so that we don't have to worry about them. And that's our objective, is to provide full sufficiency and all of those conditions involve nutrition. Doesn't matter whether it's the effect of a stress in reducing nutrient efficiency or whether it's using those nutrients to reduce the stress or to provide the opportunity and sufficiency that the plant needs for its optimum production. But it all ties back to nutrition so that we can use this then in solving many of our problems. But the importance of nutrition is that these nutrients are all part of that factory and part of that structure that's going to work for us and that's doing the work. But it's the micronutrients primarily that are also the activators the inhibitors and the regulators of all of those physiological processes in the plant. Now I've depicted this process as having the enzymes that do the work as a large engine. You can have a 400 horsepower engine sitting out there in a tractor or maybe an 800. Or so get uh, almost 400 now in some cars. It can do a lot of work doesn't do any work until you turn the key on the ignition. Just a piece of metal sitting out there. When you turn the key on, then it goes to work. What turns the key on are materials we call cofactors that are your micronutrients. If you want to turn off one of those processes, 
You merely pull the key out of the ignition or just turn it off. All of our herbicides are materials we call chelators. They can grab onto a micronutrient, most of them very quite specific for zinc or iron or copper or, or manganese, other uh, micronutrients that mobilizes it so that it will no longer fit in the ignition for the enzyme. We shut it down. That's why, uh, why we have different groups of enzymes because there are different groups of herbicides because they chelate different minerals that are serving as that cofactor for those enzymes. We have one group of herbicides called glyphosate and glufosinate. The, the uh, phosphite groups that are unique. We call them the herbicides for the 20th century or 21st century. That's because they're not specific to a particular herbis or a micronutrient like Tordon for copper or your phenoxyprop herbicides, Puma and Puma Gold and all of those that are used commonly for wheat and barley. Those are copper chelators. If you're going to use them, we tell you to get out and make sure that you're not in a copper deficient soil or that you compensate for that. When it comes to glyphosate and glufosinate, then you have a different group here because they're broad spectrum chelators. This is what makes them so unique. They chelate any positively charged ion. So copper, manganese, zinc, cobalt, nickel, magnesium, calcium, potassium, any of those positively charged essential minerals are going to be reduced in their efficiency when you use glyphosate or glufosinate. So that this makes them, in fact, they were first patented in 1964 as chelators to clean boilers, stop for chemical, as a, the patent on all of those as a chelator. Monsanto patented glyphosate then in 1974 as an herbicide. In 2000 they patented it as an antibiotic. Many of your antibiotics are chelators. Tetracycline, chelator for zinc. Why well, you have to be careful on long-term uh, tetracycline therapy because it can make your eyes especially very susceptible to fusarium. Common soil-borne fungus, normally not a problem, but if you limit the zinc, you also increase the susceptibility to some of those organisms, even though it may be important to limit the zinc to a pathogen or a disease organism in order for the body then to have an effect against it. So that with glyphosate, it's a very strong mineral chelator, very excellent broad spectrum herbicide, very excellent broad spectrum antibiotic. And if you read the paper this morning, as it was pointed out, a nightmare bacteria uh, spreading throughout the world, resistant to antibiotics. They're blaming tetracycline, streptomycin, and agricultural use antibiotics, primarily in the animal industry. They're saying we're overusing them. We use 26 million pounds of those antibiotics every year to control diseases. They don't say anything about the 340 million pounds of the most powerful antibiotic that we call glyphosate. We use glyphosate indiscriminately. Use it on your roadside and your garden. Our crop production is a desiccant. Indiscriminate use of an antibiotic 
that everybody overlooks, and yet it hits every group, taxonomic group, a beneficial organism that we have. Takes out your gut microflora. Takes out the bee and your, your frog microflora so that they're starving to death. We have colony collapse disorder. They can't digest the honey or the, the pro bee bread because your lactobacillus and bifidobacteria are extremely susceptible to the glyphosate that they're getting in the water. And so I'll have more on that as we go along. We say that glyphosate inhibits EPSPS enzyme. Glyphosate inhibits over 291 enzymes because it's a broad spectrum inhibitor to turn those keys off. If you look at that list, and this is just a partial list, EPSPS is down about midway. I don't have them all up here. It's not even near the top of those that are inhibited. So when Monsanto sued DuPont for patent infringement, DuPont's return back was, you patented the wrong enzyme. If you're talking about the shikimate pathway, then you have to really talk about the arabinoacetohepulose phosphatase, which is inhibited one and a half times more effectively than the APSPS enzyme is. That's a cobalt requiring enzyme rather than a manganese requiring enzyme like the EPSPS system. And so all of a sudden everything went sealed and confidential and nobody heard any more about that lawsuit. They patented the wrong enzyme. But there are 291 enzymes that are inhibited by just glyphosate downregulated. There are about 30 that are stimulated. And that's because of the change in feedback inhibition from enzyme function. So that glyphosate is a strong chemical chelator, chelates in the tank. If you add a micronutrient or a nutrient into the end of your tank mix, you lose your herbicidal activity. Chelates in the plant. That's how you have how you shut down that plant's defense mechanism so it's susceptible to the soil-borne pathogens that actually do the killing from a weed control standpoint. That's how it's detoxified in the soil. It's not necessarily degraded. It's merely chelated, tied up so that it's not an active entity in the soil. Very difficult compound to degrade. Monsanto's lost two lawsuits where they claim biodegradability. We know that it does degrade, but it's not a predictable entity, and half-life can be as long as 22 years. So when the almond growers shipped from California, shipped their almonds to Germany this year, they had a million pounds rejected because of excessive glyphosate. They said, well, we haven't applied any glyphosate to these orchards for over two years. They shifted, wanted to get away from the glyphosate. Yet the almond meat had excessive glyphosate levels. They found is when they used their phosphite fertilizer or their phosphite fungicides for phytophthora control that it desorbs then the glyphosate that's been building up in their soils for 25 years. Plant takes it up. It'll take it up from the roots, from the stems, from the trunk, and from the leaves. Systemic chemical, great herbicide because of that. Cause one million pounds of almonds to be rejected. We find the same thing with other crops because it can be stored in the soil, residual for a long time, and then desorbed. The factors that determine that are clay content and also soil pH. So that the higher the clay content, the lower the pH, the more stable the glyphosate is, and the more difficult it is 
for microorganisms to get to it to desorb it. You can see that effect when you've used it as a burn down, you plant your crop, and if you plant it immediately or you follow the label and it says it's safe to use glyphosate as a broadcast weed control anytime before emergence. And if you do that, then very common to have a very sparse stand, very slow emergence, very slow germination. If you wait two to three weeks, give that glyphosate a chance to be chelated with the calcium and magnesium and iron and other nutrients in the soil, then you can tie it up so that you don't have that toxicity. Again, you can see that it can be desorbed from the soil and an active ingredient then to affect your crop that you've planted. I met with a group of farmers from Saskatchewan two years ago at 18,000 acres that their wheat and barley got about five inches high and then it died. Had put out a lot of phosphate fertilizer, had a little extra money, wanted to build up the soil, and rather than pay taxes, they wanted to invest it back in the farm. Put out a little higher rate of phosphate fertilizer, desorbed that glyphosate that's been building up in the soil enough so that it killed the crop. Peas and lentils hardly got out of the ground. So that you can desorb it, you also see that, that all of those cations are affected, reduced in uptake efficiency, not just the manganese that would be involved in the EPSPS uh, enzyme system. You can see the long-term effects. <clears throat> Common farmers to say, well, my crop's not as vigorous as it used to be. Blame it on the seedsman. Well, if you're growing genetically engineered crops, that is one of the characteristics is that you have a wimpier seed because it has fewer of those micronutrients in your endosperm so that it's not as vigorous when it comes up and that's why you'll see the coating around Roundup Ready Alpha Alpha or canola that's about twice the size of the seed. Takes that to compensate for that reduced efficiency. But what you see here is the residual effect of the glyphosate that's being released enough to slow down the growth and vigor and ability of that plant to work for you as hard as it wants to work. Doesn't take very much. Less than half an ounce, four tenths of an ounce per acre is enough to reduce iron uptake 50%, manganese uptake about 80%. We're struggling with a lot of those nutrients anyway, just because of soil physical conditions and uh, pH. But then look at what happens to all three of the, the manganese, zinc and iron, as far as translocation from the roots to the rest of the plant for it to perform those functions. Again, it's, glyphosate's been a very powerful herbicide for us because it's simplified a lot, of, a lot of that management decision that you used to have to make when you managed the ecology. We went from a management aspect and philosophy to one of looking at silver bullets and stinger missiles. And we thought that every time we had a problem, we no longer had the management, we'd just shoot a silver bullet at it and that'd take care of it. And part of that philosophy was promoted because of the extremely effective ability of this herbicide to chelate so many different nutrients that it was a broad spectrum herbicide. You put it on the plant, it distributes itself, it's water soluble, systemic in the plant, moves throughout, accumulates in the growth points, root tip, shoot tip, legume nodules, and also in your seed. If you're using it as a desiccant, 
The only sink that you have for glyphosate at that stage of growth is the seed. That's why EPA has to continually increase tolerance levels. They say so that we can have safe product to market without any research to demonstrate what the level is for safety. We're up to as much as 40 parts per million glyphosate now in refined soybean oil. 400 parts per million is permitted in Roundup Ready alfalfa. A tenth of a part per million will kill the Enterococcus fecalis, the Lactobacillus, the Bifidobacteria, and other beneficial organisms that you and I need to produce the aromatic amino acids that we can't produce. Those are responsible for the dopamine, for the serotonin, for the melatonin, with that gut-brain relationship and the neurological diseases that we see now directly related to that antibiotic activity. 80% of the glyphosate stays in the, in the plant for the life of the plant. 20% moves down into the roots. If it doesn't move down there, you won't have any herbicidal activity because it shuts down the shikimate pathway in the plant's defense mechanism when it moves down into that root tissue so that all of your soil-borne pathogens then are invited to dinner. They become very active, and in four hours, Pythium and Phytophthora will have infected a glyphosate-treated plant. Normally it takes two to three days on up several weeks for those pathogens to reach the point where you're getting, producing a lesion. <clears throat> Moves out into the root system, or out of the root system into the soil, where it's also toxic as an antibiotic to your bacillus and pseudomonas and mycorrhizae and all of those other organisms that provide a natural biological control for those soil-borne pathogens. So again, it's a powerful herbicide, but a very potent antibiotic. It stimulates some organisms. Just some research, Dr. Robert Kremer here in Columbia, Missouri, at the University of Missouri. You can see 500% increase in root colonization by fusarium on Roundup Ready soybeans. There's nothing in the genetically engineered plant that does anything to the glyphosate. Still a strong chelator. You can see the effect then on the pseudomonads, the manganese reducers, your hormone producers, your nitrogen fixers, your rhizobium, Brady rhizobium. Extremely sensitive to low rates of glyphosate. We're talking tenth of a part per million in some cases from an, your gut. Uh, bacteria in the rumen of your cattle may be parts per billion, not parts per million. So a picture Dan Olson shared with me from Wisconsin. He compared an organic with non with a commercial uh, glyphosate uh, extended usage for six years. This is after about an inch of rain. You can see that there's no water puddling on the organic. You have that soil tilt, all of that soil aggregation because you have an active biology. Aggregation comes about through the polysaccharides and that that your soil bacteria are producing. It gives that soil an opportunity for water penetration, percolation. You look at what happens with six years of glyphosate. Excuse me. Water's puddling on the, on the surface. Can't get in because of the antibiotic activity. 
of the glyphosate that's killed off many of those beneficial organisms. You see the same effect on root exudate or on root nodulation. What we have here, this again, some work of, of Kremer and Means here at Missouri. Here's the Williams 82, which is the isogenic parent for this genetically engineered soybean. Roundup ready. You can see the reduced nodulation and nitrogen fixation by just disrupting the integrity of the genetic code when the genetically engineered genes are <coughs> thrown into the process. And then when you add the glyphosate, you hammer it a second time because of the antibiotic activity against the rhizobium, but also as a nickel chelator, which that process of nitrogen fixation requires for ureide synthesis. So you're hammering it on every side. Again, you can't kill a plant with glyphosate in sterile soil. You can stunt it and down and regulate those enzymes. It's stunted, but in a couple of weeks, when that plant recovers the micronutrient sufficiency that it needs, all of those auxiliary buds will break and you'll have a big bush out there. In field soil, that doesn't happen because those soil-borne pathogens, the fusarium and rhizoctonia and other pathogens, come in and take over, provide that herbicidal activity. You can see the same thing on the foliar with our it compromises the overall defenses of the plant so that since we've had genetically engineered plants, Roundup Ready, our use of fungicides and other pesticides has in increased 15-fold. Hasn't been a reduction. The only reduction was a transient little two to three year period when we reduced the amount of insecticide with the Bt genes in the plant. All of the other pesticides that we use have increased and increased very dramatically. Had an increase then in over 40 plant diseases because of that reduced efficiency. You can see some of those, this corn osprey root rot on soybeans, it wasn't a problem for us before. In fact, the only place that I've seen it is on Roundup Ready soybeans that have been treated with glyphosate. And you can see that effect here. Now this inoculated soil, and certainly with that much rotting, you'd have some economic loss, but look what happens on, when you put the glyphosate on these Roundup Ready soybeans, you greatly increase susceptibility to this disease, and I've seen losses as great as 40%. So the glyphosate works by compromising the plant's immune system or its defense system. You might say it just gives the plant a bad case of AIDS. You can see that also for sudden death syndrome. Field in Iowa up the top there. The only difference, this is all the same field this year. <clears throat> This side of the field over here had received two quarts of glyphosate burn down the previous fall. It's all Roundup Ready soybeans this year. But you can see that effect on the soil microorganisms that contain and provide a biological control for many of these soil borne pathogens, then shows up the next year, or as we see with take all even two or three years later after a single application you'll have more severe fusarium head scab and take all root rot on your plants. Field that was interesting in uh, Iowa again or excuse me this is northern Illinois where the farmer wanted to make sure that he didn't hang up his 150 foot boom on the telephone pole. So as he went a half mile down the field, he moved out a little bit. He had a green island where he still had plants that were working for him. Still putting energy into those beans. Didn't get the glyphosate there. And you see the rest of the field. 
went out with sudden death syndrome much earlier than it should have. Field of take all, this is a research field at the Peru Agronomy Farm. Same crop rotation, same fertility, same tillage for 30 years. The only difference on this field between this half that had very severe take all and just chaff when you shelled out those ears in your hand compared to this one with very normal heads on this side. These are early maturing types up here from our breeding program. The only difference on this field was that the previous year's Roundup Ready soybeans, there were a few weeds up on this side of the field and our station superintendent sent his people out and said, take them out. I can't afford to have those weeds showing up there because too many people come and look at our fields and want to see a good example. You're a heretic if you have a weed in the field anymore. You have to sit next to your neighbor that, uh, in church that kind of looks down a little askance at you, thinks you're a poor farmer. Again, this was a previous year's glyphosate, not just this year. We can see it with this year's application as a pre uh, plant burn down to. So plot again just showing the same thing where we had, uh, we were looking at different herbicides, this up north central Indiana, Penny Purdue Farm, and you can see what, what the plot looked like here. You can tell the glyphosate by the flashing, the chelation of iron and manganese and those tissues, even though it's Roundup ready. And then when we bulk seeded that to wheat the following year, we had all these plots located. And so you can see, tell where the glyphosate was by the increased take all. You can see that in many, many crops by this increased severity of the disease. With fusarium head scab and the toxins that go along with that, Dr. Miriam Fernandez in Saskatchewan showed that if you've applied one application of glyphosate any time in the previous three years, you're going to have more severe head scab and the toxins that go along with it. And if you use it every year as a burn down or maybe more than once, over a 300% increase. If you're following Roundup Ready canola, you'll see that rate, <clears throat> the severity of head scab and take all go much, much greater even. Again, you can see it with these other diseases. Goss's wilt is a problem anywhere in North America now. Costs us one billion bushel of corn in 2011. Same thing in 2012, but we blame most of it on the drought. And we saw a little less last year, but it's there primarily because of Glyphosate. You can see the increased susceptibility of the plants to Goss's wilt. It's very, used to be considered a very wimpy selective pathogen. Hadn't moved out of about seven counties in uh, western or eastern Nebraska and western Iowa for 30 years. As soon as we get the Roundup Ready plants, then start spraying them with glyphosate or with our fungicides. When you have a, a good surfactant, it will nullify the resistance of corn to Goss's wilt. Very serious concern on Roundup Ready alfalfa. We have a sister organism, Clavobacter insidiosum, that is alfalfa wilt. Very closely related, we couldn't even separate it until about the last 10 years, from the Goss's wilt pathogen, the Nebraskensis. If the same thing happens for alfalfa when you apply a Roundup to it, as happens to corn, we have the potential to lose the most important forage crop that we have because you won't be able to grow it economically. 
The only reason we can grow off, off economically now is because we have genetic resistance to that bacteria. We had genetic resistance to glyphosate or to Goss's wilt too. And as soon as you put out the Roundup, you nullify that resistance. And we have about five years before we'll see if that same thing wipes us out on alfalfa like it does with corn. This uh, shot here, you can see the non-GMO versus the GMO. Now we're also seeing a lot of the non-GMOs because we've increased virulence of that bacteria so that our old resistances aren't holding up to it. Again, when you put just put out the good surfactant, you not only lose resistance to the Clavibacter nebraskensis, but also to Stewart's wilt and a number of other diseases. So that we've changed the entire process when we've forgotten that we manage the system in agriculture rather than just shoot silver bullets at each problem that comes along. Again, genetic engineering merely makes it possible for us to apply these toxins directly to the plant without damaging the plant significantly or seriously. Doesn't do anything to the glyphosate that's applied. It's still a very strong chelator. Still a very strong and powerful antibiotic. And when you disrupt the integrity of, of the genetic system, you do thousands of other things. The concept of genetic engineering is a fossil science. Flawed science, we threw it out. That whole philosophy and theory had to go by the wayside 30 years ago. When we sequenced the human genome, Scientific American came out with its headlines on the paper and said, where are all the genes? 80 or 90,000 processes that take place that we know of that there aren't enough genes for it. Genetic engineering is based on the theory that you have one gene, one function. That's flawed science. What we understand now, and it's still primitive understanding of genetics, is that Genes work in relationship to the spatial relationship to each other. There aren't any fossil genes as we used to think of them. That spatial relationship means that every gene has a relationship to another gene. And then it's related to the environment. So it's a three-way interaction that you have for gene function. It's not a gene process relationship at all. If it was, you'd have all toes or all eyes. Because it's the same genes, what changes the function? It's the environment, that cellular environment or particular environment that's expressed relative to the relationship, spatial relationship, that you have between different genes. So when you throw in another chunk of nucleic acid into that genetic base, you change the spatial relationship between all of those genes. We know that for every functional relationship, there's anywhere from a few hundred thousand to several million other functions that are altered. Thousands of additional proteins that are produced in a genetically engineered plant that aren't normal or common in a isogenic normal plant. And I reviewed the application for a country that had been made to import 
soybeans that were resistant, not for growing, but just for consumption. They were resistant to glyphosate, glufosinate, 2,4-D, and dicamba. In the document from the company, it said, we only had to insert four base pairs. This is a base pair. We only had to insert four base pairs in order to get resistance to these four herbicides. It takes about 50 base pairs to equal normally what we would consider a, a gene. Doesn't look like they disturb very much. And then you read back in the document about 80 pages, and you find that they had to delete 4,385 base pairs in order to get expression of the four. Dramatic changes. These are just the changes that we know of, all of those highlighted with the BT gene and MON18, or here's the changes for the BT11 transformation. We've disrupted the integrity, the genetic integrity of all of those systems. You can see that just in looking at iron availability. Here's where um, Bellinois took two glyphosate susceptible varieties of soybeans and a Roundup Ready variety, looking for iron and the effect of a drift concentration of glyphosate about 12 and a half percent. And what you see is that not much different in the iron content in the leaf or in the seed, but when soybeans are deficient, and many plants are deficient in some of these nutrients, soybeans will produce a ferric reductase enzyme, push it out through the root exudates, and it changes that physical environment by reducing the oxidized iron in the soil so that it can take it up and utilize it. The genetically engineered plant is even more compromised in that because of that disruption of the genetic integrity. So it can't work for you as hard. We see that in content of lignin. You say, well, lignin's hard for my animals to digest. It depends on the lignin. The structure of the lignin in a Roundup Ready is more difficult to digest. Similar to some of the brown midribs. Some of them, some of them are easier to digest. Some of the brown midrib corn lignans are much more difficult. We're growing that plant though to, to store sugar, to manufacture sugar. We've reduced the efficiency for photosynthesis. Our nutrient availability is greatly reduced. The protein, the amino acids. And the other thing is water use efficiency. It takes twice as much water to grow a pound of dry matter in a Roundup Ready plant treated with glyphosate than without the glyphosate. You say, does it make a difference? Well, this is a drought two years ago. Iowa, or you can see the effect of non-GMO the GMO, you can see right where the second application of glyphosate, well, that makes it even worse. And you see then those differences showing up on corn as well as the uh, soybeans. You can lose 50% of your yield potential in cotton when you put glyphosate on Roundup Ready cotton because you drop all the bottom bowls. We've shown that if you'll get out there within 10 days and put out manganese and zinc so that you can reverse that hormonal system that glyphosate shuts down, you can hang on to those bowls and do just about as well as with a conventional herbicide. But you can see the effect at harvest then of those two fields. 
that were only separated by that 60-foot gravel road. Same soil, same environment, same weather, same moisture stress, but 80 or 90 bushel yield more with the non-GMO, even though it was hurt quite badly by the drought. This field was harvested for silage because this was the insurance estimate, and the farmer didn't think that he was even gonna get that wanted to harvest it for silage because he felt he could salvage more and take the insurance money. Again, I could show you a lot of pictures there. The single most predominant characteristic of glyphosate injury is bud and fruit abortion. I was in a field this, just this last week. Actually, I don't know, I've lost track of what day it is. Three days ago, anyway, in China, 200 bushel soybean yield. We counted the pods on the plant. He's 10 to 11 pods. A soybean plant can produce up to, in general, will produce up to 12 pods per node. On that 200 bushel soybean variety, he had 10 or 11. Still more potential there. Farmer in Georgia that uh, produced 169 bushel said he was harvesting eight pods per node. 70 bushel, you're harvesting three to four. Where are the rest of them? If you look, they're sitting on the ground. Aborted blossoms. We don't need GMO to increase food production for a growing world population because every GMO variety that's out there, doesn't matter whether it's rice or corn or soybeans or canola or cotton or alfalfa, produces less than the isogenic parent. I know of no, no exceptions. When you disrupt the integrity of the genetic code with the virus, something that's more like a virus infection than a normal breeding program, you disrupt the quality and the quantity efficiency of that plant. These are other symptoms which are primarily nutrient deficiency. Now an agronomist may look at that picture and say, well, there's too much residue on the surface, too dry a soil or too cold a soil. It's glyphosate. Interactions with those nutrients from the soil. And so you can see iron and nitrogen deficiency, copper deficiency. You see that graying and streaking, nickel or uh, manganese and zinc deficiency. And it's a matter of just looking. Again, you can see what a strip of Manganese and zinc foliar within 10 days after the glyphosate does for Roundup Ready cotton. You can see the effect of the, of the hormonal effect in that parrot beaking. So that no question what the effect is. And then you can look at the four hormones of the plant and the impact of glyphosate. Inhibits auxin, inhibits kinetin, inhibits gibberellic acid. Those are your growth hormones. Abscisic acid is an old age type of a hormone for ripening. That's why they use it for ripening in sugar cane and some of the other crops that we're moving it out of because of its toxicity. But you can see a 183% increase in abscisic acid. No wonder all those flowers and bulbs, bowls are dropped onto the floor, onto the ground. You can see just disrupting the integrity of the genetic code, how it reduces the efficiency of these plants. And then you add the glyphosate and you have a further hammering of the efficiency. You just keep tying the hands of that plant behind its back and beating on it. Show you for a lot of other crops. Want to get on to some other things, but with onions and, and potatoes, Farmers are complaining they can't get bulking. Can't get the size anymore. They get the, the stand, 
get the growth, but they don't get the size. I can tell you it doesn't take very much glyphosate to knock the size, capacity, the ability of that plant to store sugar, manufacture and store it in these areas. You can see the effect of no glyphosate for the previous two years, 35 40% of the crop is going to, and these are potatoes, over 10 ounce. Good sized potatoes. Look what happens when you've used glyphosate once or twice in the previous two years as a burn down. You cut it in half. And if you follow Roundup Ready corn, then it's a disaster for you. All of these had corn as the previous crop before the potatoes. Had 50 growers in the county come and say, how come I'm having problems with bulking? It's all related to the amount of glyphosate that was applied in the previous two years. What can we do then to reverse it or to compensate? You have to remember that there are two processes. You have the genetic and then you have the chemical. You can't separate the two because 83% of our genetically engineered crops are for Roundup resistance or tolerance. Systemic chemical, we should label our genetically engineered plants not as GE plants but as chemical containing plants. Pesticide containing because they contain the BT toxin. They contain the Roundup that we didn't have a significant exposure to prior to those in our food's, food uh, ability. So we need to compensate, we need to detoxify the residual glyphosate and there are some people that have some biological cocktails now, Ken Hamilton, Frank at Utah, Frank Dean in uh, Texas and several others that are coming up with those biological cocktails that can start to degrade and break down some of this residual glyphosate that's built up in our soil. We need to restore that soil microbial activity. But we have to use glyphosate and these crops much more judiciously. They should be banned almost immediately when you see what the health effects are as we had presented to us in China by 35 international scientists or scientists from 35 countries that show the data very consistent. And so we can do the compensation somewhat, increase our yields and soybeans and, and uh, corn if we recognize that this is a strong chelator. It's a strong antibiotic. It's having a lot more effect than we have generally recognized. And in this situation in Wisconsin, you see that they recognize that they had an iron deficiency on these high pH soils and had a simple seed treatment that took care of it before the Roundup Ready process. With the Roundup going on though, in the normal it knocked it to eight bushel and they only got it up to 19 bushel it was 23 bushel without the Roundup. They, with the seed treatment, it only got it up to 19 bushel because they didn't recognize that the glyphosate also immobilizes the manganese. My research indicates if they would have also applied manganese with that iron, they'd have probably had a 65 or a 70 bushel yield rather than that 56 bushel they were getting with just the iron seed treatment because they didn't recognize the broad spectrum immobilization effect of this very simple chemical. Again, you can recover that. There are at least four herbicides that will give you a higher yield, very effective weed control, than glyphosate. Now if you're using the sulfonylureas and you put them out late, as they did with the steadfast and status, it's going to hurt you or it's not going to be any better. Those herbicides have to go out much earlier. But if you're using Sure, sure Start, 25% increase in yield by just herbicide selection on a Roundup Ready corn hybrid. 
better than your, your glyphosate because not as much damage, much more selective mineral chelation. Again on the cotton. And stir the soil up. We've been no-till for a long time. A lot of those beneficial organisms have gone to sleep. Joe Nestor shared this with me. He said he's been out of uh, crop production for eight years. Figured he'd burn down that, all the weeds and from conservation uh, program. Put out two quarts of glyphosate in that burn down process. Then he planted Roundup Ready corn the first year and with another quarter glyphosate. Then he planted Roundup Ready soybeans. Before he planted his soybeans that previous fall, he said, well, it's been sitting there a long time. Went out with a chisel plow and just started to cross the field, got about halfway and it was wet and muddy. Said, I'm probably doing more damage than good and pulled out of the field. Planted it to soybeans next spring, brought another quart of glyphosate, but you can see what happened with the just chiseling to stir up the soil. Mix those nutrients a little bit with just a chisel plow, still left most of the residue on top, but stirred up the, and got some activity going in the soil again. 50% increase in yield. Said I must be breaking down my glyphosate. Did the soil test, we could account for all four quarts of glyphosate still there. It was that the soil microbes that started acting and working for him so that he could do some compensation for the effect of that residual glyphosate. Resistant weeds are essentially making the technique technology obsolete. Field in Georgia started out three years ago with just a few Roundup resistant pigweeds is what it looked like a year ago after the Roundup was applied. That's why you have a GPS unit on your corn harvester so you can find the corn. <laughs> now you can look at it for mare's tail or any of the other things there, but again, we have a lot of failed promises because it's based on a flawed science. And then you look at the food and feed safety concerns that we have, and look what hap what's happening all around you. And the only way to describe it is that it's a tragedy. The nutrient deficiencies, increased levels of toxic products, the mycotoxins, all of the other aspects and the diseases that I'll share with you here. Head scab used to be as a regular disease for us. Used to stop just north of the border of Indiana. From 1971 to 1976, I did a survey of Indiana, Kentucky, Ohio, and Illinois for this disease. Common root rot pathogen throughout North America and most of the world. But head scab stopped down about Poseyville in southern Indiana. Once in a while we'd see it move up, and then when you had the right conditions of 80 degree plus temperatures, precipitation, and flowering the same day, you would see it all in other areas, maybe even in Canada every once every 10 years. But it had to have those three conditions. You see this disease now anywhere in North America. Many other parts of the world where heavy glyphosate used because it changes the physiology of the plant so that you no longer need 80 degree temperature. The plant is susceptible from day one after you've put out glyphosate. Your mycotoxin levels go up what Andreas Tiedemann reported at the National Fusarium Head Blight Forum two years ago was that you may have perfectly healthy looking grain that can have very high levels of trichothecene toxins and your T2 toxin and zaylerone because now the toxin is produced through the root infecting 
phase of the fusarium, you don't have to have the head infection. Translocated up, and he recommended not using straw, wheat straw, or corn stubble as bedding for your cattle or pigs, because you can have enough zaylerone to leave them sterile. And that level certainly will. We've changed the system nutritionally. You see a tremendous drop in nutrient density. Here's Roundup Ready Alfalfa compared to the non-Roundup line. You see the soybeans compared with the isogenic soybeans. Tremendous reduction. We have an obesity problem for two reasons because we have a micronutrient deficiency. We can't get those digestive enzymes to function. We have a strong antibiotic in our food and our water and our air. It kills off the organisms that do most of the digesting for us. Cause the other problems. You can see again that isoline on your cattle Manganese deficiency shows up as almost an arthritic condition. Get some stillbirths, infertility, number of other problems, but you have to have manganese in order to move calcium into the bone structure. Involved in the liver and all of your immune and defense systems. This is data from Jeffrey Sheffers in Minnesota. Again, what he found was 100% of his deformed calves, extremely deficient in manganese. 63% of the normal calves, extremely deficient. Looked at the feed. These are levels, these high levels over here, are what used to be average. I don't know how these plants on this end even provided anything for photosynthesis. But certainly the mean is all those are all deficient levels from what we should have or used to have. One of those other disruptions with the genetic engineering showed up last year because we've never looked at it before. Showed up when a company was looking for food, food grade corn, did some sampling and they compared a non-GMO and a GMO right across the fence row walked in 18 paces and then took a sample and 10 paces, took another sample and did the same thing. These are compared fields, 10 years of glyphosate, GMO corn versus non-GMO for at least the previous six years. No glyphosate on it. You can see the difference in nutrient density, but what showed up was all of a sudden formaldehyde. We have zero tolerance for formaldehyde in food. What we're finding is anywhere from 10 to 200 parts per million formaldehyde in the GMO food, in the GMO grain. This may be one reason why animals can tell the difference. Those two ears, these are isogenic, triple stack, and the isogenic parent. Those two ears were put in a tree and left for nine months. You can tell which one the squirrel's like. Ones at the bottom are two bags, again, isogenics, where you have triple sack and non-GMO, and you can tell which one's the mice like. Gilbert Hostetler said, when he shared this picture with me, he said, maybe the mice are telling me something that I ought to know. Now, before one of my presentations uh, a couple of months ago, I had a farmer, I was in Florida, I had a farmer come up and he says, I grow 400 acres of Roundup Ready sweet corn. Or sweet corn every year, a little bit for canning, mostly for fresh market to ship to us up north. And he said, I just want you to know before you start, he said, I've heard a little bit about you. But I want you to know that Roundup Ready sweet corn is the best thing that I've ever seen. And I said, why is that? He said, I didn't lose a single ear to raccoons this year. <laughs> I said, what did it tell you? 
So you want to feed it to your kids. And you want to eat it with that very powerful toxin and all these other things that are in it. Again, if you want to look at medical management for formaldehyde, for all of those trailers that we call back or FEMA call back after they move people into them for the Hurricane Katrina, the highest level of formaldehyde was 0 0.097 parts per million. Developing asthma, a number of other allergies. In corn, you can have anywhere from 10 to 200 parts per million. I don't know of any non-GMO that we found formaldehyde in. And the reason for that is that you have a normal pathway, even though formaldehyde is a normal metabolite. When it goes into the C1 pathway, the formaldehyde is picked up by a compound called peturoglutamic acid. But as it's picked up, it's non-enzymatically then broken down to carbon dioxide and water and excluded. C1 metabolism is one of the other processes, the unintended consequences of this virus infection that we call genetic engineering. In fact, we have to use the virus promoting genes in order to even get expression of these other genes that we're putting in. The cauliflower mosaic promoters that we use are only about four sequences off of the HIV virus. And yet we have them in every genetically engineered plant to get expression of that DNA or RNA that's being added. Again, you can look at the uh, other problems that we're seeing. 2002, the U.S. Cattlemen's Association gave testimony before Congress of two conditions. This was before the Senate Agriculture Committee. Two conditions that were threatening the industry. One was infertility. The other one was premature aging. Take a prime beef to market and you don't get paid for our your efforts and the attention that you've been putting into that. Well, if you look at a GMO and a non-GMO fed beef, this is what you see. You see that allergy response, and it's graded down as an aging factor rather than a feed factor. You look at infertility. This is from uh, November 11th, Hordes Dairyman. Two veterinarians served all of, surveyed all of North America. Said 20% lost pregnancies is too high. Have a dairy about 40 miles from me, 70% lost pregnancies last year. Going into bankruptcy. Can't run a dairy very long if you can't have a pregnancy. The other thing that you have to look at is how many services does it take in order to get a pregnancy? For our dairy, grew up on 100, 100 head milking uh, cows. <clears throat> we averaged 1.2 services. We couldn't have afforded to go the time that it takes to go out four or five or six services. You can't afford that lost time. And then look at the loss, the percent miscarriage. In 2000, or in 1998, we had a real incidence of, high incidence of miscarriage in some animals. Thought that was just a little bubble. Continued to grow. Had a veterinarian that was told if he wanted to keep his job and, and, uh, and keep his clients, he's going to have to find out what the problem was because they could rule out the mycotoxins, the minerals, uh, the PERS virus, and everything else for uh, uh, pregnancies and pseudo-pregnancies and pigs and whatnot, so that he continued to work on it. 
went to the electron microscope to see if there was anything that, that might show up in the tissues. Found this entity, initially called a uh, microfungus, just because of what it looked like when you blow it up 40,000 times or 38,000 times. Worked on that and been working on it. Was finally able to run Koch's postulates. In other words, isolate it from aborted fetal tissue, grow it in culture, self-replicates, reintroduce it to the animal, reproduce the uh, miscarriage, and then re-isolate it. That establishes scientifically that it's the cause of the miscarriage. Went to the, said, well, where are the animals getting this thing? Went to the feed, soybean meal is just loaded with it. Find it in Roundup Ready corn, find it in Roundup Ready silage, find it in, in grasses where you've had manure with high levels of glyphosate applied to it. We didn't know what it was for a long time. We thought initially it was probably one of the world's smallest life forms. It's about the size of a small virus, but it's not a virus. You tell from the structure, it's very pleomorphic. Uh, could be an anabacter, which we now refer to medically as a biomatrix. Again, a self-replicating entity, but not a living entity. But it grows in biological system. The third one was a prion. You all know about mad cow disease, wasting disease in uh, deer and elk, CJK in humans. Those are prion diseases. Again, a non-living entity, doesn't have DNA and RNA, but self-replicates in a biological system. Taking us a long time to work it out, just to get enough to run a good DNA and RNA test wasn't easy. Veterinarians worked up a system where they can grow it in co-culture with higher organisms, bacteria or yeast, and then you can filter it because it's so much smaller than those are. But got enough, doesn't contain RNA and DNA. It's not a living entity. Again, it self-replicates. The two entities there that you have would be the biomatrix, which is a nanosized crystal, mineral crystal, that in a biological fluid will chelate the amino acids and form a protein sheath, somewhat like a, a bacteria or protein strands, much like you see in here, in these protein strands. The other thing is the prion, which is a normal component in the brain and other parts, some other parts of the body. You'll see the prion, and it's usually always associated with the mineral ion also. So it makes it difficult to separate between the two sometimes. And Pardee's uh, hypothesis in England is that what caused the mad cow disease is the cystox systemic insecticide that was poured down the spine for warble uh, control, for grub control, and that was mandated, and a year later, England had a massive outbreak of mad cow disease. The cystox is a very strong copper chelator. Prions in the brain maintain their integrity through the transition element, copper. If you put it into a copper deficiency, you end up with mad cow disease. You're going to pour that systemic organic phosphate right down the spine of the cow. It's going to eventually move in and chelate the copper. Where do you find wasting disease? On all of our copper deficient soils. Until recently, the last 10 years, it's been spreading. Covered, what, 17, 18 more counties in Wisconsin this year. Couldn't understand why. They didn't take into account that we're using more and more 
of a very powerful chelator that has a thousand times greater affinity for copper than it even has for manganese. A recent press release from USDA is that we are finding now the prion for wasting disease in alfalfa and corn. Demonstrated infectivity to mice and cattle and deer. What we have with this entity here appears to be now a prion. Two, three weeks ago, <clears throat> when I went to, uh, made a trip to London, delivered five samples for amino acid sequencing <clears throat> so that we could distinguish between the BSE and the wasting and the abortogenic prion-like protein. I like the question that uh, CDC was asked when they said, how do we sterilize for wasting or mad cow or CJK? How do you kill something that's not living? <laughs> that replicates. And it's a serious concern. You talk about antibiotic resistance, we can analog and we can, we can approach that one when you have a prion that's a lot more serious. So what C CDC recommends is autoclaving for about four times the length of time, formaldehyde treatment, washing again and then autoclaving again and hoping. It appears to be, well, it's a prion-like protein. We're not sure where it goes until we get the sequencing back. It'll be published. Where we find it again is where we have the genetically engineered crops that have been treated with glyphosate or with high glyphosate usage and manure application. We find it in corn, you'll find it in uh, soybeans, and canola, <clears throat> cotton, especially where we have uh, Goss's wilt or sudden death syndrome. Visited three days ago, <clears throat> visited with uh, Fan Xiong, who was a Chinese scientist that about three months after my letter was leaked, Secretary Bill Sachs sent me an email and said, is this your organism? Visited with her, her uh, research. She was shut down for a little while. Uh, three months ago, she was given funding and the go ahead for the inspections and quarantine division to work very intensively on this organism or on this entity because they're seeing the same reproductive failure, infertility and loss of, of pregnancies rampant throughout their industry where they're feeding imported Roundup Ready soybeans. What Sean did was merely take some Roundup Ready soybeans, grow it up to about the second trifoliate stage, did she, her background is virology, did what we would call a leaf dip assay and cut the leaf, put it on the uh, electron microscope grid, and this is what you had. Looked like you'd taken the top off a five pound bag of sugar and poured it across the table. Again, where we find it, environmentally, you can see in animal tissue, you'll find it in uh, uh, semen, amniotic fluid, placental tissue, boarded fetuses, in humans, we find it in saliva and blood. The uh, 
Dr. Monica Kruger has developed some techniques, and we've developed some here, for removing it from the animals, and that involves humic acid and clinoctilolite. Clinoctilolite is a special zeolite form, ground down, that has an affinity for this entity, and in about three months in uh, humans, it can restore fertility or remove the entity that was causing premature abortions, miscarriage. When one of the veterinarians that was working on this went to uh, the medical school and asked if he could get some miscarried tissue, placental tissue, I uh, didn't want to go through the regulations for human tissue, so, or fetal tissue, so that he asked for placental tissue. The response of the doctors was that it's normal for a woman now to have five to six miscarriages before they can have a live birth. When he asked, well, what kind of deformities are you seeing? Because you'll see many of these miscarriages also as deformities. They said, we don't even pay any attention to them. They're so common said that we just incinerate all the tissue and don't even report it. Uh, again, a tragedy any way you look at it. The proteins themselves are toxic. And I'll go through this pretty quick. It, it's a sin to uh, in, uh, get involved or to infringe on lunch and somebody else's time, but you can see there's direct toxicity to the BT toxin. There's direct toxicity an allergenicity to the uh, Roundup Ready protein that is being produced. You can see the toxicity with the genetic engineering of other crops. And uh, this Pustai's research that cost him his job at the uh, Roland Institute and the others. And the reasons for it, and you see that protein, that uh, foreign protein that's produced. You see then the transfer of genes, the ability of uh, when we're digesting our food of our intestinal microorganisms to pick up those genetically engineered genes because they're very promiscuous, they're not stable. You can pick them up, soil microorganisms can pick them up and then re-engineer. One of the reasons why we have some of the resistant weeds, not just from pollen flow, but from microbial. The genes can be transferred to our intestinal bacteria. And you see those that converts us then into our own living pesticide producer. And what they found in Quebec when they were doing blood sampling was that 93% of the women contained the BT genes in their blood. 80% passed it to the developing child in the womb. And you see that. This is the second long-term study, there are only two, on the safety of GMO crops. This is the Carmen Leaguer study in Iowa. Again, you can see the GMO feed, the inflammation of the stomach, the deterioration of the intestine, the leaky gut type system, the changed biome that all goes with that and with the glyphosate that's contained in those feeds compared with your normal stomach. This is what ours would look like normally. This is what it looks like if you're eating a lot of GMO product. That's why we need labeling. It's critical not for philosophical reasons, but for health and safety. And so you look at the chronic botulism in our animals. Have a dairy next to me loses six cows a month. I said, why don't you change your feed because it's all coming from the glyphosate in your feed, using distiller's grain, using Roundup Ready corn and silage. He just shifted to Roundup Ready alfalfa. And he said, well, I always thought that was normal. What's a cow worth, $2,400? We only keep them for one or two gestations now because they're so sick that we're afraid of downer cows. 
Get a donor cow and it's a loss. Hamburger prices are high enough, makes it worthwhile. So you call them out rather than extending that productivity period because you don't want a total loss. Chronic botulism is a chronic problem here just like it is in Europe. Austria doesn't have any. Go across the line last year, and I was in seven countries in Europe, Talk to them about chronic botulism in Austria. Don't have any. You go across the border into Germany and it's a critical problem. All related to the imported Roundup Ready soybeans from Argentina, Brazil, or the US. They're seeing it in China. China has said there will be no GMO food fed to any of our military personnel. Russia said for the whole country. If we don't get on the ball, pretty soon we won't have a market. Because other countries are clamping down and saying, we recognize these problems. And we don't want them. Again, I'm out of time, just showing the, the biological effect, that antibiotic effect. This on chickens, you'll see the same thing on animals and humans. Look at all the good guys that are sensitive to glyphosate over there on the left, and look at all the pathogens that are stimulated by it. Listeria, Clostridium, Escherichia, Enterobacter cloitia, Salmonella, all of those that have become pandemic for us. We're changing our environment. We have invertebrates, it's hard to find a frog in many of the areas anymore. Our bees with colony collapse disorder have to have lactobacillus bifidobacteria to digest their food, or they starve to death. You got plenty of food in the hive, they can't digest it because of this antibiotic that they're getting high enough concentrations from the air and the water, as demonstrated here. And then you look at the direct toxicity to us of glyphosate and ask yourself why in the world can we have 40 parts per million of glyphosate in refined soybean oil, 20 parts per million in most of our grains, 100 parts per million in silage for your cows or 400 parts per million in Roundup Ready alfalfa. And you look at the disruption of the uh, endocrine hormone system, not your pituitary, your thyroid, your reproductive system. About six months ago, the German legislature passed a bill that parents no longer have to declare the sex of their child at birth. You say, what a dumb bill. Can't they look and see what the plumbing is? You can't. <clears throat> There are so many births where you can't tell because of that disruption. We see that also with atrazine, but we don't use atrazine indiscriminately for 340 million pounds a year like we use glyphosate. But you read Tyrone Ames' work on atrazine at uh, California. You look at all the data on glyphosate, the same thing, except glyphosate is even more extensive. The celiac disease of children, severe enough to require hospitalization in Alberta. Put it up here because this curve is a common curve for 38 modern, quote unquote, diseases. All of these, fit the same epidemiological pattern with the introduction of GMO crops and the higher use of glyphosate. Many of them will extend back to 1974 as a small inclining curve or inclining line, almost straight line with the use of glyphosate alone when we introduced the GMO crops and started dumping it right directly on our food and feed, then it's taken off this way. 
And you can look at all of those charts from the Center for Disease Control, USDA, National Agricultural Statistical Service, and you see the same thing. Correlation doesn't mean causation. Served as a Surgeon General's representative for eight years on the Global Partheid Epidemiology Committee. Worked with Australians, Canadians, English, and the U.S. Looking for exotic diseases that we needed to be concerned about. Anytime we saw a curve like this, we would put a scientific panel together and say, is it causation or is it correlation? It has never been done for any of these diseases. By 2017, it's predicted that one in two children will be autistic. Right now, it's one in 48. Three years ago, it was one in 216. 1970, it was one in 200, one in 100,000. There isn't a society on the earth that just for autism can financially support one in two children with autism. Not counting celiac or Crohn's or, or any of the other diseases or the cancer. And you can look at every one of those. This is the second Long-term study, two-year study by Giles Eric Serlin and his group at the University of Kane. This paper was published, most reviewed paper before publication of any scientific publication that we know of. On appointment of Richard Goodman, who is a former associate toxicologist or senior toxicologist from Monsanto. On appointment of Richard, to the editorial board of Chemical Toxicology, the journal that published it, it was redacted. They stated there was nothing in the paper that was fraudulent, that was false, that wasn't, didn't meet all of the toxicology standards for testing, but that there were two statements that were made on cancer that were inconclusive. The statement was that they hadn't set the study up as a cancer study, which requires internationally, proto international protocol require more animals, 50 animals rather than 20 of each sex. Because the incidence of cancer is usually so, so low that you need more animals to get statistics. What happened was that rather than having to go 20 and 24 months for cancer to show up. In this study, with either Roundup at a tenth of a part per billion in the water, or the GMO protein at 11% of the diet, that you had cancer showing up, breast cancer, or prostate cancer, testicular cancer, kidney cancer, showing up at 14, at four months, excuse me, one month after the longest study that Monsanto conducted, it started showing. What's our average for breast cancer now in the United States? Used to be 74, 43. 18 and 20. Isn't unusual. Data from the National Cancer Institute going the wrong direction in some of those areas and every one of those areas is an area targeted by glyphosate toxicity. In Argentina and I'm, we had uh, uh, the senior surgeon there on these studies the last three years, 
This is from drift from glyphosate from the adjacent Ronda Pretty soybean fields. You can see their curve. This is for birth defects. You look at Ib Pedersen's data on his pigs. You see the same thing. In one of the studies for that, round, that Monsanto had conducted in 1988 that Dr. Judy Carman just got access to through a lawsuit, finds that one of the deformities is just like Ed Pedersen found in Denmark with his pigs. You have one eye, you have a cyclops deformity. You have a lot of them with neural and spinal problems. But then you have the situation that we have now in Yakima, Washington swept under the carpet for a while, but they had an invasive weed. Have three rivers going through the, the area, through the valley, of three counties there, dumped in rodeo, which is Roundup. Great for weeds, broad spectrum chelator, endocrine hormone disruptor. About a year later, you started having bursts, that's their drinking water and their irrigation water for the entire valley. Started having an 800% increase in anencephaly. A lot of other birth defects along with it. But this is what you get. The newspapers headlines were glyphosate. Brain damaged babies are glyphosate, three rivers, and anencephaly. And you have 800% increase in trisomics. You have 800% increase in heart defects and all the other problems. The midwife that finally reported on it and said, I've been delivering babies for 30 years. I've never seen this type of a problem. What's the cause? I was told that you have to be quiet. It disturbs people and leaves them upset when you bring out the problems. And so we have those problems, moms across America did their survey, released the initial data. Monsanto said it's not scientific, so it doesn't mean anything. But look at what you have as far as glyphosate in breast milk. Monsanto says it doesn't accumulate in the body. Here's what's in the urine. Here's what's in the breast milk. Monica Kruger has shown that it accumulates in the brain and the spinal column and muscle and bone, melt, other tissues, that it's an accumulative toxin. Ed Patterson, or Patterson in Denmark for his pigs get very accurate records at a tenth of a part per million. This is what the incidence of birth defects is. This is what the incidence of miscarriage. We've got 20 and 30 parts per million in much of our food and our feed. And so you see the incidence in that miscarriage. You see the hospitalizations and the other problems that you have. And I work, spend about a week a month in Guatemala, right across the border. One in four sugarcane workers died from end stage kidney failure from the glyphosate used as a ripening agent. That's why we're moving it out as quickly as we can out of the banana and the sugarcane plantations. Again, those genes are promiscuous. They move. And you have to say what's changed and why we have so many flawed and fraudulent safety investigations. And that's the primary reason I believe that none of them are ever released for public scrutiny or scientific evaluation. I need to stop here. But I want to get down, and I could go through those. We've failed to honor the precautionary principle, and I'll just summarize by stating that future historians may well look back and write about our time, not about how many pounds of pesticides we did or didn't apply, but about how willing we are to sacrifice our children to jeopardize future generations with this massive experiment that we call genetic engineering it's based on flawed science and failed promises just to benefit the bottom line of a commercial enterprise. And again, many thanks for the invitation and opportunity.
Thank you. There's not going to be time for questions.